namo chasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo chasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo chasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa sadu 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 I have a noisy phone today. Um, I think what I'm going to do, well, I can't turn it off because we always want to get to each other. Right? Okay. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to go over tonight a little bit about Donna. And I'm going to, yeah. Let's see. I'm going to read a couple things to you and then we're gonna we're going to after we go through uh, briefly go through the um, i'm not going to read the whole thing to you i'm hoping that you got it and you looked at it and read through it um so i'm just going to go through a few points on it then i would like to uh, help you to see how this Donna affects us in the mind and in the body as well, and also weaving together a little bit about the um, uh, what happens when we, we start to look at the pieces, how they are actually, there's a lot of pieces in Buddhism, a lot. But there actually isn't. I don't know whose either foot or finger is in the picture. The name is Devrat. Devrat? <laughs> kind of funny. You know, it's like this. <laughs> okay. Induji, stop your video. I, uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so let's, let's go to the, um, to the page first. And, and review what was on, what I sent you, what was there. So we go to, I share screen, is that right, Bunty? I go to share screen? Yes, and, you can share the screen, yes. And, and, you, and you put it, you, how do I get the document up from, to put it up? Just open in a, a Word document uh, and uh, just uh, share through the screen. I don't understand because usually first you put open the document first open the document okay I have to exit to do that so just a minute I'll be back um, okay first I open the document in the computer right correct, correct. whoops um, that's good it can't get to it just a second <sighs> Jeez. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what do I do? Now, now you share the screen and come to the document. I don't, I wish Just I could click see on the you share this screen. one. So, uh, share screen where? On, uh, on the bottom, uh, there are uh, icons, no? Share screen. Just click on share screen and... But are you in Word or are you? Word or are you in? I'm in Word and I just picked up, pulled up the document. Yeah. So Come now what do I do? Zoom. Come back to Zoom. Come back to Zoom. Yeah. And shares. Uh, when you click on share screen, it will give you an option to select that Word document. I can't find it. I'm sorry. Um, I thought that you were going to put it up and move it. I don't know how to get this to work. I don't know what I'm doing. No, I don't want to leave. 
Can you try to explain to me? May, can you explain to me? Um, uh, uh, Sister Kema, um, in Zoom, you just move your mouse to the bottom of the Zoom screen. And when you move your mouse over to the bottom, there are some buttons that will appear. Yes. You have chat or participants or something, and the middle one is share screen. Okay, I have share screen. Okay, now okay. I see I see the document. Okay, I see it now. Okay, I got it. Okay, this should be right. Hooray. Yeah, I say hooray, and I can actually use my finger. This is a wonderful thing. <laughs> okay, so what is Donna really? Donna is generosity, but it is generosity of, of thoughts and words and deeds. And generosity is this big part of sort of, in modern times, they kind of go right past it in, in uh, America in a lot of places. Uh, the, this is one of the things I mentioned to, to you in this document. You might see a nicely little framed tiny thing with little flowers around it. And it'll say that there's a tradition in Buddhism and that when you take part in Buddhism, you give financial support for the continuation of the teaching and the Dhamma and people decide if they want to do that or not. But there's no explanation as to why generosity is important. So this kind of uh, doesn't really go into uh, why this is so important. So why is it important? Um, the whole entire practice that the Buddha is doing uh, is teaching you. Siddhartha figured out something. He figured out way back in the age of the he figured out that he experimented to live in the wholesome and the pure or virtuous side of life instead of living in the other side where everything is dark and negative and it comes back on you and you break your precepts. So the precepts um, are really important in the sila part of it, but not only are the precepts important, the dana is given particular attention by the teachers in the beginning of teaching. And I, uh, my teacher's teacher was Usil Ananda in the West Coast, who was um, in his uh, nearing, nearing his 80s when he died in 2005, I think it was. And, um, but I also met other teachers also in places that I went with Bonte accompanying him and serving as attendant. And um, in a, had the opportunity to ask these older teachers, and some of them, the ones I mentioned here that I, I, I saw in Sri Lanka, they're in their 90s. So they've been doing this since they were young children and then full uh, seminarists for a number of years as children, and then they went up and became monks in the traditional way. But the teachers who were training them in their meditation way back there and before we're stressing that a couple things need to happen when you come and decide that you're going to practice meditation. And a lot of this has to do with the connection between the mind and the heart, you know? And if you uh, feel something, the first place you feel it, you think maybe on an EKG, we would see the mind first, but if physically in the body, where do you feel something? The very first place it happens is your heart. And so um, these monks are saying it was the first thing recommended to them before they received instruction from their teachers for meditation and serious teaching of the Dhamma, systematic teaching when they were going to stay in the camp and become uh, meditators and maybe become monks. And the reason is because when, how do you feel when you give a gift to somebody? 
You have to just look at yourself and say, how do I feel when I give a gift to somebody? And this is something I tried to point out to you in here in some places. I think I showed you how to give a gift, how to, what to do when you're getting the gift, decide to give the gift and get the gift and wrap the gift and give the gift. And afterwards, what are you supposed to do? And that's important for you to look at because I want you to experience what it feels like and your heart is open and there is a goodness inside of you. And um, uh, there's some wonderful experiences you can have as a uh, monk or a nun. Um, I decided when I went to Sri Lanka, the first time I was there, I went for about six months and I actually went, it's interesting because I went to study and ended up being asked to teach from the Majima Nikaya and dependent origination especially. But I also had an opportunity for three or four months to just live on my bowl and nothing else. And so I walked each day in the morning to get uh, enough food in my bowl to come back to where I lived and divide it in half and do a service of blessing over it and take eat half, part of it then for breakfast and take the other part to the school. And um, I, before I went to the small university is called uh, SIBA, the Sri Lankan uh, International Buddhist Academy. It's a small college in Palakele in Sri Lanka. And before I went there, I was in um, with, um, oh gosh, with a nun that was in, an elder nun, and she had a younger nun who was teaching me to walk from Horana. It was in Horana. And the place in Horana, we had to walk longer than at the university. We had to walk uh, usually about maybe two kilometers or a little two to three kilometers on a circuit. There were three circuits. There were four people in the, in the, in the nun's uh, monastery there. We had to get enough food for four or five people. The two of us are only walking. The others were elders. So we're walking and um, what I remember distinctly was the one that really touched me in that setting, the one that really touched me was that um, we went to a very small house as, uh, separate in the jungle and we're going through a path to walk through on the circuit. We went to the one house and we went pa past the gate. You don't knock on the gate. You don't ask for anything. You simply are looking down and you're thinking about Metta all the time. And they see you. If they want to give you something, they come out to the gate. And this woman came rushing out to her gate and and we paused and turned to face her and she came out very gracefully and we were looking down, but you can see her coming to you. And she put um, something in the other girls, the other nuns bowl. And then she came to me and she put one potato chip in my bowl. Now you have to understand where this was and what this house was and who these people were to understand what just happened. You had to have been there to see her eyes and to see how carefully she took one potato chip and reached over and humbly and sincerely placed it in my bowl. And then we gave a prayer and then we walked away. I told this story once and a Westerner said, that's just terrible. And I said, what do you mean it's terrible? And they said, that's horrible. She should have given you the best food she had. What she didn't understand was that was the best food she had that morning. They were very, very poor. We had to go walk a long way to get enough to go back to the nunnery in the morning on these circuits. What she didn't understand, this person that said that to me, was that what we're doing, she didn't understand much about uh, the Buddhist uh, who is walking with the bowl. 
I wrote a story once about uh, Pendipot. Um, is the monk a beggar or is the monk a king? This is the story I wrote. It's a tiny little story. And it was about this incident that that's, that was written shortly after this incident occurred. Because here's the thing. You have to understand what the Pandapot is. The Pandapot is the begging, but is it begging? And is it a beggar? Is the monk a beggar? Or is he a king? And um, somebody's mic is on. <laughs> okay. And, and so what, what am I talking about? Vanti told a story to us once on the mountain in Missouri about kingly giving. What is kingly giving? If you, a king, when he gives you something, he, as a gift, he expects nothing back, nothing back. But in life, many times when we give something to somebody, they think they have to give something back to us and all of that starts to happen in the, in the, uh, the, in the people who live in their homes, that's how it happens in, in lay life. They think it's the same, but it's not. When the monk comes with the bowl, they're never ever asking for food. They're simply walking through and when they are given the food, we give the person a blessing for humbly giving and a kingly gift, not expecting anything back. Give, that's their chance to give us something. So actually, that was her offering. And she, the thing is, she, when she went away, walked away, I saw the corner of my eye it was glowing. As poor as the place was, and as poor as they were, she walked away. Sister, um, yeah. I don't know who the host is. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. When she walked away, she had had the opportunity to give something like a king would give it. That's the point. And so this is the story, the misunderstanding and the person who was upset about it, interestingly enough, had a PhD in Buddhist studies. And I would have thought that the person would have understood what it was about. I didn't think um, that they would need an explanation because they had their degrees, but this is not talked about. And then another time, to show you what's happening, another time there was a head of a department in California in a university, I don't know which one, I was on, on the internet watching him talk to 500 people and talk about the monks as a system of begging. And the thing is, if you're a monk and you have been taught correctly, you know you are not actually begging. Because if you look up the definition of begging in a beggar in an old dictionary, go find an old one, one of those big ones in the library, you know, look up the word beggar and it says something just terrible. <laughs> it says a beggar is someone who wants to be fed and clothed and has nothing at all of value to give to the world. So are you going to say to me that the Buddhist teaching and the nuns and monastics involved have nothing of value to give at all to the modern world? This is a very sad situation about generosity. So that's one thing that happened and then Another, uh, another time uh, I was talking to someone who was in charge of a very large library in a very large temple uh, in a country, uh, a Buddhist country. Well, it's, it's not a Buddhist country, but there's lots of Buddhists there and there's a big temple. And this person's taking care of the library. I asked him uh, one day uh, about um, living on the bowl and I asked him about meditation. 
And he didn't quite understand what I was saying about the bull as far as he was concerned. It was someone on the street begging. And I was disappointed. But then I also asked him about meditation. And this was about two or three years ago. And he said to me, well, Buddhist meditation is no different than any other meditation. It's just for being calmer when you come home from work. You sit for a while and you get calm and then you're happier in your family. That's all it is, it's just a stress relief. And he walked away. And I thought that we've gone so far away, far, 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 far away from what this actually was all about. So let's keep going here and see what else is here. Um, so the prepare, what you're really doing it for, you need to understand by definition, there's three kinds of generosity. And in the one generosity are your thoughts. And the second, uh, the second part of the generosity is your speech. And the third part is about physical actions. And um, you can translate this into light, lay life. There should be nothing complicated about taking this part of the teaching and living it in life everything that's in this lesson. What we're doing is we're taking loving kindness and we're building up the loving kindness meditation to change our behavior patterns and to gain more peace in our mind. That's what we're doing. And to calm ourselves and be able to make decisions, more, uh, more smarter decisions that are based on what essentially is happening in the present time and not get all wrapped up and bothered by, yeah, but this problem with what's going on right now is it's just like what we did before. And I, you know, it must be, it's going to be like this and we better do it this way because it's always been like this. Have you ever heard that in life? <laughs> And then in the future, you think about the future too much, you get so worried, you say, well, your idea is okay, but what if this happens? And what if this happens? And what if next year this happens? And so we don't try what your suggestion is because of that. And these are blockages, but they're also the reason for problems in mental health. Mental health is interesting because of the depressive disorders, which are all over the globe. And so I think the number right now is four out of five people on the street are taking some level in Western industrialized nations is what this was written about the first time uh, that the estimate was, and it, the estimate came through, it came true about six years ago, four out of five people on the street are taking some kind of antidepressant medica meditation, okay? I think that's funny. We always mix up the word meditation and medication. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Okay, but actually for us, meditation is our medication. <laughs> We don't need to buy it at the store. We have it right here. If we run into problems, we just have to look at our six R's. Ah, where's that bottle of six R's? Oh, there it is. It's in my head. Oh, I practice the six R's and we feel better. We're always working. We should be always working in life to keep our practice going. And we're doing it by the thoughts that are in our mind, by the verbal speech that we use, and by the physical actions that we play out in whatever scene we are involved in in life. So you have these three different types and these are important. These are very important. The, 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 uh, this is a good way, this little simile of it, it's kind of like a car. If you're gonna take a trip, you get your car ready, you make sure it has the fluids and the air and the tires and the well-tuned engine and everything's timing is right, brakes are in order. When meditation, it's very similar. The meditator, in order to progress easily, your heart has to be opened, your mind needs to be softened and, and pliable, malleable. Uh, without any hard-heartedness due to past grudges or anger that you're holding on to, 
And we need to begin with courage and firmness and confidence. And giving these gifts, uh, giving gifts to others helps us to understand the feeling that we should have for building loving kindness. A lot of people will say to me, I, oh, I can't figure out, or they'll say, I didn't have a good time in my, my life when I was little, I can't remember a happy time. And I'll say to them, well, you can, you can start by working with a smile, but if that doesn't work, did you ever give a present to anybody? If you give a present to somebody, how did you feel? And that's usually enough if you remember that feeling to bring up that loving kindness and start it working. Okay, but you have to work with yourself before you can give it to others. You have to straighten out things inside yourself in order to give the loving kindness. You have to be able to have enough love for yourself that you can share this love with other people sincerely share it with them. So at first, when you start practicing, you're going to feel a lot of thinking and about personal things and everything. Um, and life is very competitive and we're always competing and we keep thinking about how we're competing at work and at school and at home and everything and we keep our mind busy. But one of the things that this is an experiment that he's doing that I like to talk about is he was really curious. Siddhartha wanted to know, eventually he wanted to know but what is it for me to experience an experience of no experience? <laughs> that's a little tricky. So I want to experience, that's a verbal action. So I want to sit and I want to experience. The, an experience, which is a noun, is what this experience in meditation is, the noun of no experience. That means no movement in mind at all. Just observing quiet mind to see what would happen if I cleared out thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future. And then I'm just here in the present time and I decide to sit, what will happen? What will that happen to my brain? What? will happen when there's no pressure on it. Now, most of us are all too ready to judge situations. This comes up about this when we look at it. Without considering real information, it's easy for us to quickly judge something in life without having the facts, isn't it? People do it all the time. But you don't have to get involved if you just let things go and see what's happening right here and now as you're going along in life right away. Just like that, I lightened your life. There was a German film, uh, or I think it was made in Hungary, no, I meant Romania, I think, and the film became very famous. It was all about living uh, the life, reclaiming the lightness of the being. And the being is, this being is talking about just living life. We are so wrapped up in everything. We get, everything gets so heavy so easily. One of the quickest ways for us to experiment with investigate or explore what would it be like if I wasn't running thoughts of all that happened before and all that might happen tomorrow. And I was just living in my own little meta bubble. You get in a meta bubble in the morning and can you stay in your meta bubble all day? You sit in your meta bubble and people come and they try to push the bubble you smile at them and allow them to speak if they want and you listen, but you do not react. You're in a meta bubble, <laughs> You're not a meta bubble. And you watch these people through the window in your meta bubble and they're very upset and sometimes very angry and you think they're suffering. Ah, now you're in a Karuna bubble. 
And the Karuna bubble is you're letting them have the space to have pain and suffering and just talk or say bad things and stuff, but it doesn't hurt you because why? You're in a meta bubble and a karuna is in there with you. And now you're developing what? You're developing a clear kind of joy of just the lightness of being inside the bubble. And then you see what's happening outside. If somebody's going to fall down, you can pop your bubble and catch them and make a number bubble and climb back in. <laughs> you, can, you can help people. Don't, don't think that we're supposed to isolate ourselves and just not help anybody. That's not, that's not what this is about. When I went to one book, um, the my book is called The Buddha and His Teachings by Narada. And that book is available through, I think, K. Sri Dhammananda's books, or else you can go to um, Taiwan to get that book, the, the Taiwan publication system. And that book is really good because it tells you who everybody is in the stories, all the people and how they were involved with the Buddha, the different monks and their backgrounds and what they were known for and everything. And it teaches you the basics of what the Buddhism is all about. But um, when I was in there, I'm looking around and when I started to look at generosity, I'm there, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Because almost every story was giving up your life for somebody or, you know, the one story was a monk in there where the, the two monks were on the mountain and they saw a tigress and she had three cubs and she had not very well and she couldn't nurse her cubs she didn't have enough food for them and they knew that the tigress needed meat in order to survive and so at first the one monk said to the other monk go back to the village and tell them what's going on maybe we can get something to feed the tigress but he looked again at the tigress and he said well i don't know this body is just a problem for me. Maybe I can feed the tigress. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to put this out, you know, and recommend you feed the tigress, okay? But I can show you some other ways where you can help someone and it's not out of your way to do it. And it just happens. It falls on your path. It falls on your path. And then you uh, you get to help that person. And let's look here for just a minute before we do that. Have you ever been in a situation where people around you are just unfairly criticizing a person, but the person is not there to defend themselves? This can happen. And so what can you do? That's gossip at its worst. And one of the things you can help that person by thinking kind things about the person and the energy will help them in the office. But also you can speak to other people just in a conversation. You know, it's not a bad idea to gather the information before coming to a conclusion and talking because you don't know what's going on. There's a lot of this going on right now in the world. Oh my goodness, in the United States, all the politicians, oh my, the movie stars, oh my goodness. <laughs> Almost anybody's church and anybody's center and anybody's group has some of this going on. But what you can do is bring up to people because they forget that maybe it's a good idea to get the information before we start talking. Just by doing that to help someone is stepping out of your box and helping someone else. And then complimenting people in the office is a form of, of uh, generosity. It's a simple form. If you see you have somebody who's in the office or working in a bank, uh, we suggest this all the time when I was in employment consulting with companies. If you have this person and they can do the work, but they don't want to kind of open up. They're very shy. Maybe you can let them know that they're doing a good job, that they're dressed nicely. Maybe that they had a good smile this morning and it helped you. And that's a, a form of validation. 
by now, I hope everybody has gone and looked at the film on validation. <laughs> Somebody wrote me a note and uh, said how much it just was wonderful and they loved it so much they shared it with their family. One of the things that I came to the conclusion maybe about five or six years into Buddhism with training, I looked around me and said, why is there so many conflicts in this world? And if I played, I was playing the game that the Buddha was actually using for investigation. Let's see what the problem is and see what the root cause is. And if this is, we think this is the root cause, is there a root cause for that and a root cause for that? How many root causes are there? And, and where did this all start? The real problem, you know? Uh, and so looking at that, I wanted to know because there were a lot of wars that were happening, popping up all over the place, sending our boys into war again and again. And it came to me that all the conflicts in the world, they occur the same way. When one side takes action based on an assumption without having the real information, it's right there, the first line in that, what's on the top right there now. And, and then I could prove that out almost every time I could prove it out. It didn't matter if there was a conflict with two people I was counseling or a family between some siblings and some neighbor's siblings or, or two houses, two towns, two cities, two countries. It was all happening the same way. We ended up in Iraq simply because um, we didn't have good information. It, it was incredible, but then when I looked at the whole picture, whatever conflict you feel is really bad in your life, if you look closely, you really don't have all the information you need to make the judgment you are making when you dive into reaction. So this is is being generous by backing off and really beginning to look in life what's really going on before I decide to take an action. So there are a couple things we need to try out for ourselves. When you're practicing TWIM, we need to feel the openness in our heart. And we, as we are performing the generosity, discover what it feels like just to say, to, to mean and do what you say. And take a note here and there. Keep a little notepad or you all have phones. You must have notepads in your phone. Little tiny notes that you can refer to. And that's how you begin to open up your heart and lighten up your mind. But if you can't see how this is a broken spot, you can't fix it. And so you keep track of these, you're going to find out they're really needling you, just needling you and needling you, like poking you like this. And they're all the same. They're all happening the same way. Okay, what about physical deeds? Well, physical deeds open the door. We, we talked about uh, a couple things, but physical action has a lot of different shapes and it involves putting yourself and your time aside for others these opportunities everybody has them some people go right by them other people for some reason from your family or your grandmother like my grandmother always told us if you don't stop for somebody if something bad happens and they fall down and you're there then when you fall down Nobody is going to help you get up. It was an easy lesson. She taught some very wise things when I was little. When we were on the beach by her house, uh, many when I was very small, but we would hear the sirens for the ambulance where they had these accidents on this one road pretty often. But whenever we heard the accident, my grandmother was there. She would say, okay, everybody has to pray. Everybody stop a minute, think about these people and hope that they are going to be okay. Well, why did she want us to do that? It was an opportunity for us to think about other people, but it was also the same lesson. If I don't do this in the universe, 
for someone else, why would they happen to turn up to do it for me? I guess the most recent one of these was I was in a taxi in uh, Colombo in Sri Lanka, going down to the bookstore downtown from Panadura, which is about an hour away. And as we got into the city, all of a sudden, there was an accident where a guy was on a motorcycle, ran right into a panel truck, right into it and fell off. The panel truck had no signals on the back and um, he didn't see that it was gonna stop. That's actually what happened. But my taxi driver was real interesting. He was Buddhist. He had his little Buddha right there, okay, on the dashboard. He said, I, I hope you'll excuse me, I, I need to do something, I'll be right back, and pulled over and parked on the left side. And then he jumped out and ran across the road and got the guy up, helped him get his bike onto the sidewalk and helped him call for help. And then he said he had to go and he came back and got in the cab. Oh, it really made my day to see him do that. He was a lay person who just stepped out of his line of work that moment and gave something to someone else. The merit that he gained for this was immense because he put himself away and just went and did it on his intuition. The spur at the moment things are when you are the first one on the scene, somebody needs help, and this can be anything that happens. Are you willing to put your life aside for a minute and help another person? And this was uh, some examples of this. And then what about merit in Buddhism? Merit has to do with uh, generosity. And the merit uh, traditionally was coming from the generosity, uh, the generosity, the dana line, the merit was part of that. But merit in recent times has gotten sort of odd. And in staying in some temples that I've been in, the same families come and give these huge meals to the monks and that's it. And it's like, that's going to take me somewhere in my next birth and that's it. And it is a good thing. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. I'm just saying that when you teach children in Sunday school, I'm very strict about teaching them about what Madonna is the way you think and speak and act at home with your parents, your siblings, and everything. It isn't just the highest Donna you can do or merit for merit is to take that meal to the monks or if somebody builds a new place, you furnish it or something like that. That's great. But anybody, even that woman with that little tiny potato chip, anybody can give a kingly giving in many different situations, not expecting anything back. When he stopped for that guy on the bike, he didn't know the person. And so he did that totally off his lifeline and helped someone else. And he didn't expect anything back. So that's a kingly giving. And that's the highest kind of giving that you can do. Then there's a story that we all should remember, uh, the Dhammapada story about the person who lights a candle and then they walk through the village offering their flame so that the other people can light their candles and they can all have light because nobody had any way to light their candles. And so this happens anyway all the time in these tiny villages, this happens. And that's a simple one. Um, every time you are sharing merit, or every time you do an act of giving, you are letting go of craving and clinging. So this is an extension of your practice. This is what we're talking about when we're saying that this practice is a practice of meditation, but a form that you can take into life all the time in all 
of your situations. I was talking to somebody recently and um, many of us have a pattern of behavior that we would really like to not have. <laughs> a lot of people have one in there somewhere. There's a pattern. And the, the problem is, what are we doing when we're saying, I've had this pattern so long, I can't change. Well, the modern term in my, when I was growing up, it means you copped, you copped out. <laughs> you just let, you just copped out and said, well, I can't do it before you even looked at it. And the thing about the way we're teaching you is we found out in the text that this practice really was exactly what it said it was. And um, I have to go here for just a minute. Uh, on my phone because um, I had to look it up today. I had to verify what it was. Um, there's a book, Karuna Sena. No, Karuna, no, I meant, what is it? Oh, I did, I lost it again. What is it? <laughs> Name. It's not Karuna Dasa. It's, um, oh, well, anyway. He's a professor at the University of Hong Kong. It'll come back to me. And he, in his book, he did um, a, um, he did a book on the fundamentals of Buddhism. And it's the reason I really like his book a whole lot. He's an elder man. He was a professor at University of Hong Kong and I met him over in Sri Lanka. It's because when he did this, he did it as a uh, PhD thesis, but it comes out as a perfect book and very readable. And um, it's 10 chapters and each chapter is precisely 10 pages. It's wonderful, it's absolutely wonderful. And you know how sometimes theses, they get so big and overbearing and you don't know how to read them and maintain the information, but he, he did a perfect job on this, I thought. He's in his 80s now. When I'm over there, I usually go to see him. I taught him to do TWIM, and he was really amazed. He always wanted someone to show him how to do something useful, and he started him and his wife doing it, and it's really nice he did that. I want you to think about, uh, I'm not sure if I put it in here, so I'm just going to say this to you. Um, there are six specific characteristics of Buddhism, and that's what he calls, um, it's not going to turn, is it? Okay. Uh, that is what he calls this, where it's um, Swakata, let's say Swakata, the Dhamma is well expounded. Sanditiko, it is visible here and now. Akaliko, it does not involve time. That means when he says it does not involve time, I spoke to him about it. What he's saying is the instructions are timeless. And if you have the instructions correctly and you apply them, they should operate the same way they did in the time of the Buddha. And that's what we're always telling you about, okay? Okay, the next part is, um, um, go away. Uh, uh, it involves inspection. And what this is, it actually involves deeper inspect, invites, I'm sorry, it invites inspection. And I always add to that, it invites deeper inspection because if you, uh, it says it invites inspection, come and see. And that's a Ipasaka. He's saying that is what a Ipasaka means. He's a Pali scholar, a very famous Pali scholar too. And it leads inward, onward, it leads onward step by step to a goal. And that's Opanayaka, Opanayaka. And then it is to be realized for yourself. By, and then we, we say by the wise. Realized by yourself. So it's like when Bhante says, I can't give this to you. I can 
guide you and show you how to do it. But I cannot give you the results to this. You have to do it yourself. That's what this step means. And um, we always say, it's many, many translations by poly scholars. I always say it is to be realized by yourself, but it is to be realized by those who are wise. And the reason we add the word who are wise, those who are wise, is pachitam veditavo vinuiti. The reason we say that is because we know the code word that I teach you about when I teach you dependent origination. So it is those who are wise is the meaning of it is actually saying for those who learn the dependent origination, uh, it will be realized by them. And the reason is because you are a we want you to be learning how to see the phenomena, each phenomena, uh, how it originates and disappears and how you get involved with it, how it causes suffering, the danger of that and how to escape from it. And, and that is your six R's. That's why we treasure this tiny uh, explanation of right effort, which is we call six R's, but it's right effort. It's purifying and then it's retraining your mind. Now, when we are Buddhist, should we ever give gifts? This is another question that Q has. Q is my partner in when I wrote these. Q had to be here to ask the question and I was the answerer. So when we're Buddhist, should we ever accept gifts or should we just be giving gifts to others? Uh -huh. It's a very good question. And in balance, a person should remember about receiving a gift is important too. And why is it important? Well, helping others to build their merit in an act of generosity in itself is a form of dana. So if you offer me something and I say to you, you like what, one thing happened one time long ago, someone offered me a, um, I offered somebody, I offered somebody a coffee cup through their house. You know, I offered them a kind of coffee cup. And um, the person said, oh, that's not my style. I don't, wouldn't use that in my house, but thanks for offering. I was devastated. <laughs> I didn't know what to do because I had gone in this shop and very carefully gotten this for them. And, and I think that's the thing you have to be careful of is that when this happens and the person didn't know how that was so important, um, what she didn't realize is this. If somebody gives you something and it's not fitting your decoration in your house, you take it very gracefully anyway, and then you own it. Once you own it because it was given to you, you should then give it to somebody who can use it in their house. And that is also the secret. Why do monks not have a lot of stuff? <laughs> Because when we travel, you would not believe what they give you when you travel sometimes. And then if we can't use it, we, we, it might be very beautiful and we really think it's wonderful. But if we can't use it for the, for the center, we're going to give it to somebody to make them very, very happy. And that's what happens. Um, and you know, the way it happens with money in our system, if somebody gives you money, actual money doesn't hang around in our pocket very long. If someone can't eat on the street or is hungry, the money goes to them pretty quickly. If it's not being used to support what's going on for us, it goes very quickly. It doesn't stay in our hands any more than 24 hours. We try very hard about that. Uh, so we should be accepting the gift. Helping others to build their merit is an act of generosity in itself. And the uh, person giving the gift to you is practicing generosity and this should be supported and not turned down. So if you do not need a gift that you are given, certainly after you own it, you can share it with somebody else. And you can learn to do that. You don't have to be a monk to do that. 
Is there a proper way to give a gift? This is an important lesson. It's something that everybody should teach their children because it's a wonderful experience. Everybody should teach their kids this. Is there a proper way to give a gift and a way to receive it? Yeah, there are a few parts to the giving of the gift that should be considered. First, you prepare the gift with a happy mind and a good intention. Second, you see the person happy in your mind while you're handling the gift and wrapping it, preparing it. Then you give the gift with loving kindness and a smile, and then you reflect on having given them the gift afterwards with joy in your heart, and you feel that. And that's a very nice lesson to teach children because then you let the event go gently into the past along with the other postcards <laughs> of different things that happened in your life. And this is the proper way to give a gift. See, we don't tell you to forget about and throw away what happened to you in the past. We tell you to get a three by five card and catalog it and put it in a box. And then if you want to look at the event and learn something from something in the past, that's good. That's not ignorant. That's good. But you don't get involved in the uh, thinking that you are reliving the emotions and stuff like that because they're all used up. And it, you remember it's from the past. It's not part of now. So what, what about receiving the gift? Well, when you're receiving a gift, you receive it graciously with a smile of acceptance and sending loving and kind thoughts to the person giving the gift is very good. And afterwards, you keep a light mind and you have fun creating happiness for other people. And when you're finished, then that's the end of the event. You move on with life. Everything is about a Nietzsche. It's about moving, changing, the flux of the, everything moving. Can these acts of generosity involve all three parts of thought, word, and deed at once? Yeah, they can. Suppose you're in a food market line and the mother with a small child in the basket is standing in front of you and she's struggling to empty the basket for the new cashier who's nervous and, and not, she doesn't want to block the line too long a time. So she's nervous. Her baby is starting to fuss and maybe cry. So while you're standing behind the basket, what can you do? What can you do? You're just standing in line. There's 40 people around you. Everybody's sort of wishing the baby would stop complaining and wishing the mother would cool it and wishing the cashier would hurry up. Is there a potential for generosity in the situation? So you think, well, I bet I can make this little baby smile um, just a bit and calm down. So I might compliment the mother about this baby's just beautiful. And then mothers just love this. The mother is just in great shape now. And then you say, begin sending loving kindness to the little child. And young children pick up on this right away. They pick up on it. So they don't be surprised if they look up at you with big eyes and you start to occupy the baby how? Well, peekaboo, boo boo, peekaboo. Gets even funnier if I have a mask on. <laughs> You know, you can play a little game with the baby and the baby's going to just watch you and then the mother's going to empty the basket and the cashier's going to calm down. And then everybody, this is interesting, you don't believe you can affect people around you, maybe. And if you do this exercise on a Friday night in a supermarket, afterwards, you cannot deny that all those other 40 people they were really happy that you did that. <laughs> and they all felt much calmer when the baby wasn't crying and the mother wasn't upset. You see? So you do affect it. Your energy affects people around you. You're, you're circled around with an aura around you. And I can't see auras, but I sometimes have been with people who can see them. And I love to say, is it pink? Is it blue? Is it purple? <laughs> what color is the art and then they tell me what uh, what that means and i think it's fun 
So how is all of this preparing you for your meditation? The entire meditation practice is about opening the heart, emptying out old suffering from the past, from the mind. And it's about letting go of all the rubbish in the past. And a lot of suffering is stored up inside us and we locked little gate in our head. But when we start meditation, what happens is you loosen that gate. This is what the meditation does. You loosen the gate and then it slips open and then this stuff can fall out different ways. And this is one of the ways, the very first one is the generosity practice. So we begin to practice generosity. We're going to open the gate and let some of it out. And we need our heart to be operational and not tight when we start the meditation. And we need to be gentle with ourselves. We need to smile. And if we prepare first a little bit, we can handle the outflow better because these, through these acts of generosity, we begin to feel like we're ready to go a little deeper. We're ready to watch, go beyond this stuff that starts coming up. You can let it go more easily. And that's how your practice of the six R's is, is helping you. Now I'm going to go off of here if I can figure out how. Ah, okay, stop share. Woo, there you all are. Okay, so now you're back. Okay, I'm going to read a couple things that I found that I really liked. Um, that uh, one of them is in um, the Samyutta Nikaya. If you have a Samyutta Nikaya, you can go over to page 1795. Okay. And um, this is this is talking. It's in the um, Sotapatisa. No, so oh right, Sotapata, Sotapati Samyutta, on page seventeen ninety five. It's talking about um, there are four things. I'm sorry, four things. There are chamberlains, and a disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha. And he recites the um, Arahan Samasam Buddha, Vijay Charana Sampano, Sugito Loka Vidu, Anutura Parisadama Sarati Satadeva Manasana Buddha, Bhagavati. This is just nine qualities of the Buddha. Nine qualities of the Buddha. Okay? And then uh, he possesses uh, confidence in the Sangha. He praises them. And then he dwells at home with a mind devoid of the stain of stinginess. That means you don't give anything to anybody. You don't do anything to help anybody. You're just going to go through life yourself like a little tiny island and just not pay attention to anybody else. That idea is absolutely positively not Buddhist and absolutely positively there is no way you're gonna to go to Nibbana that way, just to clue you in, okay? Uh, so he's not, he's devoid of the stinginess. He freely, he's freely generous, open-handed, open-handed like the taxi driver, freely generous like the girl with the potato chip Delighting in relinquishment, delighting in giving up things and making life simpler. One devoted to charity to those who are on the street. Boy, this is easy in India. You can, I remember when I was in Sri Lanka, remember I told you I walked with my bowl, got enough for breakfast and lunch, but, and I also always got enough that when I had my food in my bowl for lunch, I had a little one wrapped up for the old man on the street when I had to walk to school from the house. And he was there every morning. He figured out I was there, so he was there, but he got his breakfast every morning and he was crippled. Open-handed, uh, freely generous, delighting in relinquishment, devoted to charity, delighting in giving and sharing. That disciple who possesses those four things 
can say they are a stream enterer. This is the academic stream enter, no longer bound to the other, to the netherworld, fixed in destiny and enlightenment to his destination. Now, I like this for a couple reasons. This paragraph, it's the paragraph on the bottom of set page 1795. I like it because it comes back closer to what the deal was about Sotapanna. And Sotapanna has been spoiled, very badly spoiled by making all kinds of mistaken assumptions about it. Um, like if, if you're a soda pana, you absolutely can't break a precept. Or if you're a soda pana, you will never do anything selfish again. These are desperation for translation. So you don't really have to spend the time looking up at what soda pana was or something like that. I don't know how it happened, but the extremes that have happened to soda pana and I, when, when I tell people some of the things I've heard, they don't believe me. And I, that's okay, but they really happen. And the, the, the heaviest one, the heaviest um, slippage, I call these, I don't want to say they're perverted definitions, but what I say is they're slippages across 2,600 years. This soda pana position has slipped to gotten, gotten so hard that somebody can say what I'm going to tell you. Now, a man and his wife and two teenage kids came to me for counseling when I was in Sri Lanka, and I was at the university. One of the, one of the professors sent them to me. They had some problems at home. So I spoke to each one of them for maybe 10 minutes, and then I brought them together and sat down and read some things to them. And I said, you really don't have a problem in your home. You see, the problem is that you're not forgiving each other and you're not practicing loving kindness. And I can show you how to, to start working with the loving kindness and the compassion, but you have to apply these things. And, and he just, when he said, what do you mean? I said, you need to meditate together once a day. And he immediately went like this. Oh, mm, oh dear. Mm. And I said, well, what seems to be the problem? And he said, well, our monk at our temple in Sri Lanka told us it's not worth spending any time in your life in meditation at all. And I was surprised. I never heard that before. But then he kept talking. He said he told me that to be a soda pond, it could take me 1,000 years. Well, immediately, my, my mind is going nuts here. You know, my mind is going crazy. You know, because first of all, you're here now. And if you don't understand it, I'll show you in a minute. You have been born into a lifeline period between the time the Buddha came and he taught what he found and it still exists and it's still here. This is called the dispensation period. And it's going to be here as long as there is this information. Even if people can't explain it really well, if the information's still on the surface, in order for the dispensation to end, all the information has to disappear. All the monks are gone. All the temples are just old buildings sitting around. Nobody's paying any attention to it anymore. And it, it goes further in the prophecies. It says, there will come a time when you will see a monk standing on a corner in a country that was Buddhist. And, it, and he will have a little money bag around his neck at that point. And then the deeper point, and there will come a time when the only way you will know anyone was a monk or a nun, you will see a lay, a lay person with a thing around their neck, the color of a monk's robe in sort of like an amulet case. And that's all that's left. And if you ask them, what is that? They'll say, it's an amulet. They don't even know what the Buddha was anymore. And then when that's gone, then you got about 20,000 years and Maitreya can come. 20 to 30,000 years is what they say, okay? So if you don't think you're special, you need to think again. 
because you and I are living in what they call, it's not the bottom, the dregs of this whole thing. It is this time of the saints. They call this period the time of the saints. Usulanada told me that. Usobina, the other monk that was the same age as him in his late in his 80s, told me that. The 90-year-old monk, he confirmed it in Sri Lanka. This is the time of the saints. There are among us people who can explain things like I'm explaining to you and like Bonte explains about the operation of how to escape and to free your mind from suffering that can still be explained from the words directly of the Buddha. That's what this prophecies and the, the uh, whatever, the pro there's two sets, prophecies and the other word I can't remember. <laughs> and, and so when you um, say, well, where are we in this? You have no idea how special you are because when that guy, who that monk said that to that man, when that man dies, if he thinks he's coming back again and gonna keep coming back to keep trying to become a Sotapanna for a thousand years, then we're really lost. And if that monk thinks, didn't think that through when he said that to that man, that whole congregation of people believe that meditation is nothing to do with your path. And, and it's just something, it's falling away. And all this has happened from the gradual separation from the training period in meditation as part, as connected with the Dhamma simultaneously. That's why we're doing this course so that you can kind of get a better idea of how this is all starts to connect. Now, I've got another one to read you that's kind of interesting. This is for people that have the book, you know, if they have the, the um, if you have uh, the uh, Majima Nikaya, I was kind of excited because we, I was found some notes as I was hunting through. Um, this is about the fact that you're doing a serenity and insight meditation. And they are yoked together. Now, for those of you who don't understand yoke, do you see this is a this is a bull and this is a bull. And I'm going to have the bull pull the cart. Okay? In order to have them pull the cart, we have to put a harness on them to hook them together so they can pull the cart together. The, the bulls, the two bulls have to be trained so that they cooperate with each other because it's pretty worthless if you have one real powerful one and he pushes everything so the cart goes this way or the other one is powerful, pushes the cart this way and they can't pull the cart through the gate to sell the harvest. <laughs> this is a problem. So I was watching these bulls, you know, uh, when I was near Nagpur uh, and he was coming across the bridge with a great big sugar cane on, on the back and uh, the one bull was uh, having a problem and I got the person who was with me, one mother monk, I said, ask him why that bull's so bad with this cart, what's wrong, you know? And he said, oh, the one, the one bull who grew up with the other bull, he died. And they took a young bull and tried to just hook him on there. And it was a lot of hard work to make that cart go over the bridge. It went like this, you see, because the man had to work really hard to pull. That's what it is. If you had a country fair uh, back home, we have country fairs. And I always like to go and watch the horses, the teams of horses pull the sledges. And the sledges are... Uh, Slay, they're a sled with concrete on them, and they have competitions for pulling the sledges in the, uh, the autumn fair, the, the harvest fairs. And you watch these horses, they've been training so hard to get them to pull the sledge and keep going as far as they can pull it and see how much weight they can pull without fighting each other. So that's why when you go back and start to really examine uh, the uh, suttas that um, were involved with the meditation in the texts closely, you stumble on these things. So on page 1364, 
in the Majim and Nikaya, page 1364, at the near the bottom, there is a note. And the note is here uh, in for Sutta number 149. It's a note. It says here, serenity and insight represent the entire Eightfold Path. Serenity and insight represent the whole entire Eightfold Path. And we're going to look at that later on in the course. We're going to look at that one. And then uh, on page 1365, uh, at the bottom of the section on 151, Sutta number 151, there's a note, and that note is 1351, okay? And this is interesting because sometimes we have questions with people saying, when you're an arahat, or if you become an anagami, and you don't think you can go any further, but as, especially the arahat, there is a, questions that come up about them. And the arahat, do they ever have to meditate anymore? People say this sometimes to me, and I didn't know exactly how to answer, so listen to what's here. Although the arahat who has fully realized true knowledge and deliverance, so he's fully understanding the Dhamma, this is what the true knowledge is, and can comprehend it and explain it, and his deliverance, he's gone through the super mundane Nibbana experience. He has no need for further training. The Buddha has said this in different places. Do they still need training or not? Okay. And he continues to cultivate. It says here, he has no need for further training, comma. He continues to cultivate serenity and insight in order to enter into the joy and bliss in the jhanas and the fruition attainment of arahatship is what he's saying the fruition attainment of arahatship is that he can just sit and come completely away from life now the anagami level can sit for a period of time up they can learn to do it up to seven days if they have uh, anagami and fruition we have students in Indonesia who can sit one of them I think the longest one Ardika you have to tell me if I'm right or not but I think it was 54 hours is that right the longest one yep yes yeah, sister. that's what it was how they do that they're learning to do what's called mastery of determinations and someone said, well, what's that? Don't you just learn to meditate? And that's it, you go away and you meditate. And I said, no, it kind of never finishes. It's very interesting. First of all, you think you understand the text, but if you keep listening to, one time I took one sutta, 48, I think it was, I can't remember, but I think it was 48. And I kept listening to the same sutta at least four or five times a month for a whole year. And you know, what I knew from that sutta initially, you cannot even compare to what I understood after a long time of listening to the same sutta. So this is not a book you pick up and you read it and you say, well, I read that book. <laughs> and the one to listen to it one time, I had people say, can you not teach us, you know, suttas that we, don't usually hear in the retreats. Well, the thing about that is, if you're practicing after your retreat, you are fine tuning. You don't even know what's happening. Once you have gone into the first jhana, this is my theory about this with all my students. Once you go into that first jhana and you're able to experience up to first, second, third, and the equanimity one time, wow. Something happens inside you, and you can tell me if you think it's true or not. Something opens up inside you, and it starts to move. And it's like moving towards the ocean. It's like when I show you uh, the end of the sutta, 
when I read you the end about the raindrops coming down and they turn into pools and they turn into uh, streams and they go into creeks and river and streaks in creeks and then brooks and then rivers and then they flow down to the ocean of wisdom eventually something inside us clicks and it starts moving so why is this important well you have a downtime you're away from a teacher you don't have advice from the teacher for a while you're not writing us you don't understand we really are here for you and if you have stuck get stuck and you're one of our students and you write us we are going to write back to you and advise you where you can go on the website to get um, the clues as to how to fix what's going on in your practice that's what we're all about we're guides we don't want to be the guru we don't want to be um, you know the famous this or that that's not what this is about okay um, we're, we're happy with saying guide we're afraid of even saying teacher and then you become the greatest teacher. Now that's not it, we're guides. So what are we doing? When we put you in a, a nine or 10 day retreat, we make a little track for you and we're trying to put you in a little car to go down the track for 10 days. And if you, f we, we need to interview you every day. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Most, most retreats, you might see the person once during a short retreat like that. If you're in a month retreat, you might see a teacher two times. But what was going on in the Buddhist camps? They were constantly working together, these groups. You know, that's an issue for me. They were talking to each other. Oh, you're not supposed to talk to anybody about your practice. Oh, don't talk to anybody about your practice. That's what I hear these days. I understand the caution of that. But if you're in a school with one teacher and you know all the people who are at the level where you are, if you talk about what it's like for you and what it's like for him, and you, you know what happened to him might happen to you or what he tried might work for you. So what happened in the Buddhist camps? This is the description from the text. I can find it for you later and read it right directly, but it works like this. There are four pairs of people in the camp. You know, eight kinds of people in that camp. Eight kinds. Who are the eight kinds of individuals in the Buddhist training school for meditation? Who's there? Okay, the first group is the group that's coming in to try to become Sotapanna. They don't really talk that much to each other, you know, at that level. But once they become Sotapanna, the second, the second one, that's a Sotapanna, trying to get to Sotapanna group. Then the ones that get to be Sotapanna break off to be the ones that are trying to be Sotapanna and fruition. And the ones that are Sotapanna and fruition, they start to get into another group. And they're the ones that are just talking about becoming Sakadagami. And then Sakadagami and fruition. And then Sakadagami and fruition and trying to get to be Anagami and Anagami to Anagami fruition. And if there were get, if you get as far as Arahat, even those Arahats are sitting and talking. You know, the, the largest Arahat garden in the world is in Japan at the conferences where we were. They had 500 Arahat statues on this hillside all through the woods. And from all the stories and all the traditions of Buddhism, they had these Arahats sitting in circles and standing in groups and one of them was playing a trumpet <laughs> and i thought i said bonte said oh he, he was not playing a trumpet i said yeah i think he was and he said why i said because when you do get developed in your mind and you're a musician your piano playing your flute playing your violin everything changes even your voice becomes more precise and you begin to hear the numerical structure in the music like you never could before. And so why am I not still singing? Oh, come on, I do sing the dependent origination song to you. <laughs> but I can still vocalize by myself in the woods where you're not around, where only the, the, the uh, squirrels and folks that live there are there. <laughs> And if I'm vocalizing, I can do things I never could do before with my voice. And I'm not that high of an attainment. I'm not. So the point is that 
This stuff affects you internally and mentally, starting to work different together as you are developing your meditation. And what do we say you're doing with the six R's? You are purifying and you are retraining the mind. Now, I'm gonna do one more thing with you and then I wanna have at least 15 minutes left to do questions. So I gotta share the screen um, because it's gonna take me a minute to um, draw this one. Um, Yeah. Okay, I guess I'm going to do this one. If I do this one, I might do it again for you the next talk, but that's okay. I want you to see something. I want you to see from what we've done so far in what you know about the precepts and you, you are familiar with the Eightfold Path and um, you get confident and you know, you know about the 37 pieces 37 uh, factors of enlightenment. We've talked about it before, but I want you to see a picture. It's just one picture, and I'm going to try to draw this for you. Uh, so bear with me. I got to go down here to the screen and get a white screen. Then I have to disconnect you. Nothing personal. <laughs> but I have to disconnect you in order to do this because I have to put this um, in front of me to do it when I get on the, um, okay, now, the first thing we're going to do is the three things that we're going to weave together. So you, because people ask me all the time, what are you talking about weaving things together? Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the using for the parts of our weaving we are going to use the the five precepts and then we're going to use the eightfold path and then we're going to have the hindrances show up and see this is one of the things i do i try to um make pictures <laughs> i make pictures so that um Let's make this a purple umbrella. Okay, so we're going to, on this side, we're going to put an umbrella. My umbrella's not so great. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have giggles in this thing too. Here's the top of the umbrella. And we have to go um, four, and this one. I'm going to fix this one. Oops! I oh, I don't want to mess that up. All right, look, I'm going to turn it down here. I'm going to put it this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Jackie said to lay them straight. Okay, so now this is your, your your umbrella. I guess I got fixated on umbrellas here because it never stops raining. <laughs> this is where your umbrella comes up and it has a piece on the top. Now, when we talk about this, we're going to show you, I'm going to show you how Whoops. Whoops. Whoops.
Jesus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Now we're going to put some names on this. And first thing we're going to do is we're going to just do the pieces of our, um, the pieces of our, um, our precepts, or no, I'm sorry, the Eightfold Path. So this is um, your perspective, perspective. Of life. The second one is your mental imaging. These are the thoughts that you keep in your, the thoughts that you keep in your head, mental imaging. Next one is communication. Communication. And the next one is, can you hear me okay? Uh, no, there's someone talking just now. Is it Sushila? Okay, somebody needs to stop talking, okay? The communication, okay, your, your communication, and then the movement of attention. Okay, and then the next one is your lifestyle. Your lifestyle. And the next one is your practice, your 6R practice. And the next one is observation. I'm gonna do this one this way. <laughs> I don't know, well, I keep going. Observation. And this is this is basically mindfulness, right? The observation. And the um, the last one is the uh, collectedness. We'll say productive collectedness. And collectedness is the proper not too tight, not too loose, level of concentration you need in order to observe the origination and disappearance of all phenomena that occur. That's what happens during, during the meditation, okay? Now this umbrella, we're gonna make a special umbrella. This umbrella has a, um, a yellow one year they made these umbrellas that were really cool because they had um an extra piece that went like this and went over the top like this and when you opened your umbrella this piece was here and that part is, doesn't look real good but i'm going to try and do it <laughs> This is where your precepts fit. Your precepts fit. You, you have these, uh, your five precepts. I'm not gonna, <coughs> I'm not gonna write out the precepts. I'm just gonna say that there's, there's precepts here. Whoops, whoops, what happened now? What happened? Where is it? I don't get back to it. Somebody tell me. I don't know what I did. I touched the wrong button again. Where did it go, Bunty? Does anybody know? Oh. 
So it seems like uh, 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 they are starting to chant, like evening chanting. That's why probably he's not here. Oh, here, no. I don't mean that. I mean, I'm trying to show you how this works. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, so your precepts, your precepts are in this layer, okay? I'm just gonna go like this. I don't know where this belongs. Anyway, and there's pre precepts over here. So the precepts are over top of you. If you look at this, this is a protection system and I'm not gonna have enough room to do this. Oh boy, what am I gonna do? Um, but we meant. Okay, so when you see yourself, you, you are holding onto the umbrella and think about yourself holding onto the umbrella. Now, what's helping you to keep the rain out? What is the rain? Okay, we have to have these guys come into the picture. And um, I normally had enough space, but I don't know what happened to this. Um, Okay, now I have enough space. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see, we need a dinner color. Okay, these are your hindrances. Your hindrances are lust and greed, hatred, aversion. Sloth, torpor, restlessness, guilt, remorse, and doubt. So, so if you just think about it, when it's raining, these guys are the rain and they're trying to come down on you like this. See? But you're protected by the precepts. Because the precepts the cause of the hindrances arising is the breaking of the precepts. Now, you could have broken a precept when you were young, and it's like now the, the fruit of that action is coming back on you. Or it could have been that you broke a precept in another lifetime, sometime before some other, and it came in with your consciousness into this lifetime. Now it's, it's trying to burn itself off. But what protects you from these bothering you you is the precepts protect you in life i'm talking about in life this is important okay and then the other part of this is um when you you guys need to go down here a little bit okay now under while you're under your umbrella you are going to practice so your practice is happening here. You're practicing under this umbrella. Now the red part, the red part is the Eightfold Path. And there's several things we want you to discover about TWIM as we go along. Because the Eightfold Path, every time you practice the six R's, you complete the Eightfold Path. Actually, I can do it even better than that. Um, there was a class I had with 12 women in it, and they had to take a turn and tell me what did they do in the past week um, to practice the Eightfold Path. 
And they all had excuses one way or another, but the last girl, uh, they were telling me they managed to do it once or twice the whole week. <laughs> you know? And then I got to the last girl, she was looking really sad. And I said to her, well, what do you do for a living? And, and she, she, first she said, I didn't practice at all. And she looked really sad to report that to me. But I said, what did you do for a living? She says, I'm a customer service representative. And I said, oh, well, that's different. You did it all week long. <laughs> and then she said, what do you mean I did it all week long? And I said, if you're a customer service representative, that means that you are supposed to keep smiling no matter what's happening. Did you smile? Oh, she said, I always smile because they're coming in with a complaint. If you are uh, smiling, then I said to her, um, that's a good perspective to have in life. No matter what they're saying to you, you keep smiling. Okay. So that she was practicing, she had to understand she was practicing uh, this one, you know, pers pers perspective was good. And I said, how about what were you keeping in your mind? Kind of images were you keeping in your mind while you were talking to these people? And she said, no, I was smiling. So I had to keep good images with good energy in my mind. I said, you practiced the mental imaging very well. And then I said, were you upset with these people? She said, no, if I was upset with them, I would lose my job. So you had good communication while you were working with these people, even though they were upset with you. And she said, yes, she said, yes. And then I said to her, um, with your attention, was it on the people or were you trying to figure out how you were going to fight back or what? She, no, my movement of my mind's attention, I kept my attention on them and what their problem was and I wanted to make it better for them. So her movement of mind's attention was staying on the present time with each person she talked to. That's what she told me. And I said, that's perfect. So your lifestyle must have supported you. I, she said she lived in a small house, but she had a place that was private for her to meditate. And she was meditating and practicing. So her lifestyle was in order. And were you practicing the, the practice? She said, that's what I was trying to do with the people. I was practicing my six stars all the time, but I didn't realize I was doing the whole thing. Well, I said, well, were you observing what was happening, whether it was in your actions were coming from the past or the future and, and you were reacting or were you acting in the present time? were you observing that? And she said, absolutely. I have to stay with the person, one person at a time. That's how I was trained. So a teacher or a person in public service, especially a, you know, a person who like this kind of job has to be practicing the Eightfold Path all the time. And then the last one was she had the correct amount of collectedness in her mind not to get mad. She had good equanimity to keep doing in life. So she was practicing the Eightfold Path all the time. And when she practices the six R's, she's fulfilling the Eightfold Path. But when she smiled, she also was doing the whole Eightfold Path. And that's what she started to realize. I'm actually using the Eightfold Path. I said, yeah. So did, did you get upset at all? And she said, no, I was not. I said, did you, did you get uh, angry at them like you wanted it to go faster? She said, no. So you didn't have lust and greed bother you? You didn't have aversion bother you? She said, no, I, do you keep your precepts? And she said, I do keep my precepts very well. So she didn't even, when she took a break, I said, you took a break. Did you have sloth and torpor? She said, no. So she didn't have that one come up, right? That one. And she was never getting restless about her work. When she went home, she went home and sort of like she hung up her coat or her jacket or put her bag on the table. And when she went in that house with her family, she left it all behind. So she was never restless about it or complaining and upset about guilt. Uh, remorse about what she did. She didn't suffer those. 
And she had no, she just didn't doubt she was doing her job the right way. So you see how she's applying this Eightfold Path to her life is what she's doing. Now, if you want to play with this, you take a smile and you say, when I smile, when I smile, do, am I applying the Eightfold Path when I smile? Yes. You have the right perspective, good mental imaging, good communication. Your attention is on giving this to someone else, and so you're practicing dana. Your lifestyle has supported you so that you can have this smile in the way that you're learning, and you're practicing your six R's if anything goes wrong. And you pay attention, you're observing things as you go along. You started smiling. Did you just go and start smiling to see what would happen in your office? I challenge you to do this. This is the way we do it. So these, the, this is how one picture just comes together with several parts and just we hooks it all together and look, it's all working for you, this whole thing. It's working for you. This is all working together. And then as we go along, we go and do a lot more, a lot more, whoops, a lot more that we can hook together in different kinds of pictures and show you how it's actually working. This is where I like to have fun because when I teach in a group of people, some people can learn by just the uh, meditation and the Dhamma talk and taking notes. But there's always a number of people sitting there trying to figure out, okay, how do we hook all this together? And I started drawing on whiteboards about two years ago in Australia, because a lot of people I knew were visual learners. When you have a visual learner, just making the person to put it down again and again, it doesn't always work. So this is why I really like to draw pictures and I see it that way too. Also along with the, underneath the umbrella, you can also put down the other pieces of the 37 requisites. Okay, I'm gonna throw this open now. I need to get some questions. Um, anybody have questions? Hmm? We got about yep. 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, I, I came in a bit late, but I, I heard you say something, um, that the three uh, levels of giving, a slave yep. of giving, friends of giving, and a master of giving. Could you give us a um, uh, or king of giving? Is it? <laughs> oh, kingly giving. That was the ah, story. Ah, yeah, yeah. Like, did, uh, did you get did you get the printout? This is. I think I don't know if that's in there or not. If, if is that? Um, let me uh, see. I think I, I heard it. I heard it at a Dharma talk. Uh, somebody talked about the slave of giving friends of giving and a master or king of giving. I, I think it was from the king. Anguttara Nikaya. Yeah, it's in a different book that way. That's a particular situation. One of the things about the slave of giving has happened in uh, some of the traditions where the person might have taken the Bodhisattva vow and then they go a little bit too far believing that Every second of my living life has to be giving and caring for other people. And I actually was counseling some families in New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey one time. I was actually counseling some families on the stress of going too far with this to the extent that the families were having trouble because the person, the head of the house was not home long enough to take care of the family. It was only taking care of other people. This is an imbalance. We have places in Buddhism where we learn something, but then we go and we get um, imbalance. Another one is um, the slave to the precepts or the slave to uh, misunderstanding uh, the Vinaya. And when I say that the Vinaya is for the monastics, it's not for the lay people. So if I say to you, you may not, um, uh, kill or harm any living beings on purpose. We mean that 
in one sense for the lay people, but when you get to be the monk, you're not, this is funny, when I grew the string beans in the garden and it was time to harvest them, Bonte could come out there in the garden. He could point to the string beans that were ready to pick, but he couldn't pick them. See? So he couldn't pick them. I had to pick them and put them in the bowl and take them inside. Okay. Well, another situation that was for the monk, but it wasn't for me. You see, I could pick the, the beans. I could till the soil and plant the seeds as a seminary. I can do all these things. As a bhikkhuni, I can't. Sister as Kate, when they mention friends of giving and master of giving, uh, how, how is that different? You know the what is this? We, were, we weren't talking about that tonight. We were okay. talking about what kingly giving means. And kingly giving means you give something to a person expecting nothing in return at all. So you have no, no precedent of if I give this to them, they'll give me a good gift next time type thing. Nothing's in your mind at all except giving the gift to the other person. That's what your kingly giving is about. Um, and we also talked about Donna in, in respect to talking about Donna tonight, we talked about going off your lifeline, so to speak, means uh, that it's, it's tremendously good when you, you're talking about the level of merit in things, the quality of merit that somebody's doing, um, to stop your car and help somebody who just fell off a bike. We told that story with the taxi driver. And another case was when I was walking home um, with the nun one day from our Pendipot. Uh, I was coming back to the house and she was coming back to the school. Some people ran out of the gate of the house on the corner and said, before you leave, could you please come in the house? And we said, why? And they said, our mother is dying well, we're not going to say no. And we went in the house and sat there and then they decided they had got her ready for us to see. And we came in the kitchen. She was lying on a big table and she was uh, propped up uh, and she, they said she could not speak at all or have any expression, which I, I found out wasn't quite right because she had some expression to me, but she was looking out a window in the kitchen and they told us the story that her husband had asked her to marry her, him under that tree. And then they, uh, they built the house on that property and they were married for 65 years. And he had died and she was there and about to die or very close to it. She, all she wanted was us to say the basic prayers uh, in a normal service and her precepts. And she had been longing, they thought, for a nun or a monk to come by. And so we went in, we took the string out of our bag and had the string connect all of us together in the kitchen and we gave her a blessing and did her precepts. And then uh, we, they gave us a little bit of food in our bowl and then we left. And the next morning the neighbor told me she died that night. But when I left her, I looked in her eyes and told her it was okay, that she was gonna be fine and she just, looked so happy she her face was just lit up and then that night she left and i thought it was very precious you know to catch us on the corner like that and pull us in the house and have this uh happen yeah but that's the way it is i mean it's very simple in the neighborhoods and everything very very, very down to earth okay so did i answer your question I mean, that's what you're talking about is the slave to Donna or slave to generosity is the one that systematically does it and does it and does something over and over again. But it isn't sincere. It isn't so sincere. It's like, this is what we do every Sunday or this is what we do at all the time. And this is all we have to do <laughs> is this. That's that one, okay. And then the other slave to... Um, the, to the uh, uh, to the precepts going overboard with the precepts and the German guy he lived in a uh, a row house with a row of houses hooked together where each one had a little bit of uh, yard in the front a little bit of garden 
and we found out that he was in trouble with his landlord and we asked him why and he said because i won't cut the lawn and all these little houses were perfect except for his house and his house was this high the grass and nothing was uh, kept at all and uh, they they said he would have to pay a fine and they would come and clean it up or he would clean it up you know he had to clean it up period he had to be responsible in that kind of a living situation but he was not a monk and he was trying to keep a, a vineyard rule that was nothing to do with lay people so it was like he was a slave to this idea of these rules 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 and that's not the way, uh, the healthy way to develop all of this, you see, yeah? Okay, okay, anybody else have a question? Yeah? You can take two more questions, I think. I hope all of you saw uh, Dr. Perel's, um, um, that you were able to see Dr. Perel's drawing of the smile that we pass around and we put it on the group. If you didn't see it, go see it. It's really neat. And um, David has already asked to use that maybe at Damasuka. He likes it so much. I'm really glad. Yeah, you had a question, May? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Sister Kema, just to double check with Professor, is it Professor Karuna Dasa who wrote um, early Buddhist teachings? Yeah, the thing is, when he told me this, um, I wrote it down and I don't know where I wrote it down. <laughs> it's really good. Um, okay. Is Bhante still there? Dhamma Gavesi? Bhante Dhamma Gavesi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I just I was just looking for the book. Second, this is the book. What's it Karuna name? Dasa. Karuna Dasa. Karuna Dasa, right? Karuna Dasa. It's a university. Okay, of thank you, Bhante. Okay. Early, what's it called? Early foundation of Buddhism. Early Buddhist. Uh, early Buddhist teachings. Early Buddhist.